Let's continue our little amplifier video sequence in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, published by McGraw-Hill, October 2013, the third edition, edited by me, uh, previous editions, courtesy of Traster and Lisk. This new edition has a spiral binding for the paperback, good heavy stock paper, and I recommend the paper version for your workbench because it'll lay flat for you like this. It's not that expensive in case something happens to it, like you shoot a piece of hot solder at it while you're working on a circuit or something. A lot better deal than a tablet computer. And there is also another very important asset to all of my paper books, and I say this with a certain measure of regret. I had the opportunity to proofread very carefully every paper-bound book, every hardback or paper-bound book, every book with paper pages. I had the opportunity to proofread it very carefully so what you see is what I approved, and if there are mistakes, they're my fault. In electronic books, I have discovered, unfortunately, Mistakes appear to creep in that have nothing to do with me, have nothing to do with McGraw-Hill. They apparently have something to do with the transition process or software between the hard copy paper-bound book and the electronic version. I have seen some of the most inexplicable errors creep in. Not very many but occasionally, and, and reviewers have sometimes written disparaging remarks about my work, but I had nothing to do with it. I couldn't prevent it. So it's frustrating for me as an author to see that. Um, I remember calling a um, local technical guru about this issue. Uh, it happened to be over the air on a local uh, radio station, and he said that he was sorry to hear that, but unfortunately that's progress. Well, I should have said, I didn't, but I should have said, well, if that's progress, I'd hate to see what perfection looks like. But anyway, real perfection, as close as I can get to it, you can be guaranteed that I put every bit of effort I could into proofreading my hard-bound books. Based now on that, let's turn to page 79, figure 4-19, a buffer amplifier circuit. Uh, it, it's a generic or a hybrid block diagram, schematic diagram, crystal oscillator, buffer, and amplifier. Well, what the heck, you might ask yourself, what the heck is a buffer circuit for? Well, a buffer is, in fact, just an amplifier that serves to isolate two other circuits from each other. It helps to prevent impedance uh, reflections that could, for example, in the case of an oscillator, buffer, and amplifier, the buffer helps keep the amplifier from loading down the oscillator to the point where it won't oscillate anymore. That buffer provides a high impedance input so that it doesn't load down this oscillator very much. Well, on page 79, figure 4-19, let's just look at how the signal flows through here. It flows pretty much the same way as it did in the amplifier that I uh, showed you in the previous video with the NPN bipolar transistor, except this particular circuit uses a field effect transistor instead. It uses an N-channel field effect transistor. The arrow points in at the gate. So this is the source, the gate, and the drain. We apply the input to the gate, just as we would apply the input. Now I'm modifying this diagram a little bit. This input here actually comes from a crystal oscillator in figure 
but it could be anything. It could be anything where we want to have a buffer between one circuit and another. So we have a capacitor. We have a resistor here to bias the gate. We don't need a resistor going to the positive voltage here with a field effect transistor because field effect transistors are biased somewhat differently than our bipolar transistors. But the source arrangement is basically the same as the emitter arrangement was in the bipolar case. A capacitor and a resistor. So this is another generic amplifier generic broadband amplifier, more or less like this. The difference is that a, a bipolar transistor tends to have a rather low input impedance, and that's something we don't want if we want to build a buffer. That's why we use here a field effect transistor, which inherently has a high input impedance. But otherwise, we take the output through a capacitor just as we would in the case of the bipolar transistor. Now the gain of a buffer doesn't have to be very great. In fact, some buffers are built to have a gain of unity. Gain of unity. That means a gain equal to 1 or 0 decibels. That means it doesn't amplify, it doesn't attenuate, it simply serves to isolate. Although you might want some amplification in a buffer, particularly in the design that you see on page 79 of this book in figure 4-19, you would want to have probably a little bit of amplification here. You can tailor the values of these components in order to make that happen. Here, a resistor connects to the positive 12 volt or whatever voltage it happens to be power supply. So we get current flowing through this device and it's regulated by the voltage on this gate. And a gate is essentially such a high impedance that rather than thinking it as, of it as a current valve, uh, you can think of it as well, it's a current valve of sorts, but instead of... of uh, it just works differently than a bipolar transistor does. If you really want to learn more about all of that and what makes bipolar transistors different from field effect transistors, I recommend this book, Teach Yourself, Electricity and Electronics. Oh my, it's close to 700, over 700 pages of really juicy stuff. It has evolved ever since 1992, so it's about a, what, a 20-year-old book. This is the fifth edition, the current edition as I make this video. I recommend that if you really want to learn more about how these um, types of things work. Gee, there's some debris getting on my quadrille paper. Wonder, uh, now, debris doesn't get on it when you're doing it on a screen capture in the computer. Uh, a bug can crawl across my screen and you won't see it. We hope. You never know, though. There's a first time for everything. But anyway, this is basically just a, a, an amplifier like the other amplifier was. But its purpose, once again, is to isolate between two other circuits. In the case of a very simple crystal controlled transmitter that you might build if you're a ham radio operator and you want to do a little old-fashioned operating, uh, you can go ahead and build an oscillator like the one in figure 4-20. Uh, once again though, this is a hybrid block and schematic diagram. Crystal oscillator, buffer, right here, and an amplifier, you know, maybe a two or three watts something like that on 3.5 megahertz. So that's what a buffer is designed to do. It is just like its name would imply. It kind of creates a buffer zone between two other circuits or devices to help them both operate properly without 
bugging each other. Stan Jabalisco signing off from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America. Until next time, so long. <laughs>